Hi everybody, welcome to Missy's Imaginings. I hope you're doing well. It's kind of dim outside. We have snow happening, which is fine for today because it's the weekend, so I don't mind. I don't have to go anywhere. And I have a project here. There will be a little bit of math, I'll warn you, but we're going to go over this um, because I found a beautiful pattern that I wanted to make and I found it on eBay and I'll hold it up here but I'll also put a big picture so you can see uh, a bigger image. But it's just a beautiful gown. There's several pieces to it and so I thought that's really pretty and I looked and looked and this is the only one of this actual design that I could find. There's a bunch of other ones that um, I really like that I'm watching that I might get a couple of them and uh, I'll go ahead and like put the user seller name on eBay in the description if you're interested in looking at them. But this is the only one I could find of this design. So I thought, okay, I'm going to go ahead and take a closer look at it. It is for a 16 inch doll and it doesn't say what particular doll. I don't believe it just says 16 inch lady doll LB1. So um, a lot of antique collectors might know what that means better than I do. But in any event, I thought, okay, I'm going to go ahead and buy this pattern. So we're going to go ahead and take a look at this pattern. It came with the cover, which tells uh, a little bit about it. Um, it has the images. It shows an image if you want to use it as a bridal gown. Um, it's from Lynn's Dollhouse Patterns, uh, P.O. Box 8341 in Denver, Colorado, 80201. And so this is where the pattern came from. The inside has all the instructions. Then the actual pattern pieces will unfold them look like this. So there's um, a tabloid sheet of pattern pieces and then we have a legal size sheet of pattern pieces and this one is also a tabloid sheet of pattern pieces. So it took me a few minutes because I like to read over everything and, and take a look at it. But in order to use the pattern, um, very similar to a lot of the patterns that I have on the website, you have to do some assembly to the pattern pieces. So in looking through things, um, it ends up that this big piece here gets attached to this large piece here like this to make one big piece. And then it also says on the bottom to extend the skirt another three inches. So then you would have to make three inches more width on the hemline of that piece. Also, let's see, there are some little images here that there's a little undergarment that you can make. It's a little one piece undergarment. The pattern has the one piece undergarment. So once the addition has been made to this is the overskirt, then there's also pieces that will form a petticoat as well as the gown skirt. Then there's pieces for the bodice, which is attached to the skirt. And then the overskirt has over bodice pieces that are also attached with the fluffy things that go over the sleeves. So yeah, a lot of pieces here. <laughs> but here's the deal. So I got this, but I wanted to make this for my 61 centimeter Huarong. So I wanted to take this pattern, which is 16 inches, and 16 inches is actually 40.5 centimeters, but I want to make it for a doll that's 61 centimeters. So this is 
maybe stepping out of bounds. I hope it's not, but I paid for the pattern, so I want to use it for my my project. So the first order of business is I need to enlarge it so that it will fit my doll. Oh, it also came with a little glossary for and hints for putting in a zipper, I believe. Or making buttonholes, buttonholes, I guess. Something like that. So, in looking at some math, I have my trusty little board here. The 16 inch doll, so 16 inches, is equal to 40.5 centimeters. But my doll is taller, so I need to know how much to enlarge this pattern. So, I know that my doll is 61 centimeters, so I can say 61 centimeters is what percent of 40.5 centimeters? So that's my question, because I need to know how much this needs to enlarge to get to my 61 centimeter goal. Now, here's the thing, when you're doing math um, and sentences, a lot of people say, I hated word sentences in math. And I had a lot of students, they hated word sentences. But here's the cool thing, when you're working with percentages, if you can remember that the word is means equals, and the word of means multiply. There we go. So now I can say 61 centimeters equals what percent of 40.5 centimeters. Now it becomes a little more of a, a recognizable math problem. Now for a lot of people they say, yeah, but I still don't know, am I, what am I doing to find this? And if math is something that easily frustrates you, I get it. It can be very complicated. If you've done a lot of this, it'll probably seem obvious. So in either event, here's what we can do to make it a little bit more familiar. Put this language into something that you automatically know. I mean like from grade school know. Okay, so here's our little hint in this box. Are you ready? And you're going to say, oh yeah, now I know what to do. So six, we know, equals two times three, right? We all know that. For the most part, we all know that. So we know that six equals two times three. So if we're missing the two, how would we find it? Oh, well, we know that we can divide six by three. Even though these numbers are different, we've got a percentage sign here, it looks a little more complicated, the math is the same. It's exactly the same. All we have to do, I'm going to grab my phone calculator here, is we say 61, because that's in the place of our, what we call the, the product, the answer. So we have 61, and now we know that we're missing the 2, so we would divide this, this by this, so 61 divided by 40.5 equals 1.5. And there's some other decimals, but... Now to change this to a percentage, all we have to do is to move this two places, and we get 150%. So, to make it sound a little bit more familiar, we know that 61 is larger than 40.5. It's bigger. So it is natural that the percentage is going to be over 100% because it's more than this one. It's total. So the total is going to be more than 100% because if you have 100% of something, you have all of it. So if we had 100% of 40.5, it would mean we would have all of 40.5, but we have more than that. That's why our percentage is higher. So on the Xerox machine, 
if I want to get this to the size I want it, I would need to enlarge it by 150% on the Xerox machine. So that's what I did. So I hope that makes sense. I hope it's helpful because um, sometimes math can get a little twisted and overwhelming. I have my little notes so that I would not over talk. <laughs> So I hope that's helpful for you when you're calculating. Now, if you were going the opposite direction, we will show that. So in this case, I am going from a small pattern to a large, a larger size. So I'm going from small to large. So that's why that's the order. Remember that these two can be switched, and if you just use the of and the is, then you can kind of get it in the right order. But if you had a large pattern and you wanted to make it smaller, you would just do the, the opposite positions. So you'd say, well, now I have a pattern for 40.5. So 40.5 is what percent of... 61. So that's like if I have a big pattern, but I want to do an MSD pattern, but I only have the SD size, so I need to shrink my pattern. Well, then we would do the same process because see our equal sign is in the same place. The of or multiply is in the same place, and these can switch out so I can have the word or the math symbol there. I kind of switched them out. So if you have that case where you're trying to go from an average of a 61 height pattern down to MSD, we could say 40.5 divided by 61 equals, now we're going to get 0.66, remove our decimal two places, or 66%. So if you have a large SD size, you want to shrink it down to about a 40.5 centimeter size, you would reduce the pattern by 66% on a Xerox machine. So there we go. So there's some math. I hope it's helpful. And after the math was done, uh, and what I had to do is, is look on the, the machine to see uh, some were already programmed into the machine that I was using. And so I did one that was pretty close and I got my new pieces so now we're going to take a look at those so here are my larger pieces so I have my this was on the page so it got enlarged as well the little undergarment pieces so now I have the pieces for the undergarment that look like this they're all cut out and this piece then I have the bodice dress uh, pieces here and the sleeve. And then the sleeve will have an additional piece to get the puff around the elbow. So there's the bodice pieces. There are pieces for the lace overlay on the bodice. So there's this cut on the edge of a lace. Then the, the bodice pieces and then some little caps. Then the tricky part came to the skirting. So there's a yoke for the petticoat and the skirt. And this piece, when I measured the waist, because it will have a little bit of gathering in it, I knew that I could make it work. But my doll is a little bit larger than what these measurements would be. Um, but I knew that this would still work, so I didn't have to worry about that. I went ahead and extended. Um, I had to do the math for three inches. Ended up being, because you're supposed to add three inches to the length. And it added ended up being, I think, ten, because I first switched the inches to centimeters. And then I do the enlargement, and it ended up to be like 10.7 centimeters in length that I needed to add to the petticoat pieces. So I did those and I got all the pieces added, 
But then I realized, oh, but on the one petticoat, you don't add the length. That's for the overskirt. You actually add a ruffle. So I still needed the original petticoat pieces. <laughs> so I have the petticoat pieces that will have a ruffle. The overskirt with the extended length. Is this clear as mud? Oh my goodness. Then the great big piece that took a lot of pieces of paper because it's big. So here's my big overskirt piece. And then this piece had to be extended. It says to extend an extra three inches, but it ended up being like 10.7 centimeters. So I extended by taking a ruler. Let's see if I can do this without spilling everything. And on the hemline, just going from here, just all the way, making a dot at that measurement, and then connecting the dots with a line to get my line. So this is the overskirt piece that will have a lift in the back uh, left side. So it's a little wonky shaped, and that's what kind of threw me off at first when I was trying to going to put it together. I thought, well, that doesn't make sense if it's like this and it's all one piece because it's not going to be the same. But then I got to reading, and this real pretty lift right here, where you can see it kind of lift up, that's only on the left side of the gown. It's not on both sides. So I thought, oh, well, that's, that's why. It's as if you're lifting the skirt, you know, to walk, but it's only on the one side. So I thought, oh, okay, well, that's why it's shaped weird. So here's my large piece. Okay. So now my pattern has been enlarged. Okay. And it's huge pieces and stiff. And <laughs> I thought, okay, now my pattern is enlarged. Okay. Now there's a little bit more work to do. So once you have your pattern enlarged to the appropriate size, now I want it to fit my doll. Now most of the SD girls, this will work, it'll work fine, but my Hue Are Wrong by Angel Studio has a fuller figure through the waist, like her rib cage and her waist and her hips. Um, the bust isn't a large bust, it's kind of normal so it compares to most of your average third scale dolls, but the waist and the hips are a little bit thicker because she's sculpted a little bit more like a real person, um, a thin, good, shapely person, but she's not sculpted in the waif style um, that is very popular in dolls or the very unrealistic Barbie size uh, dimensions. She has more, she has a very hourglass figure, but it's just a little bit more natural. So I went ahead and measured the doll so I could compare it to these pattern pieces. So what I did is I just drew a sketch and I did a bunch of the measurements on my doll. So when I get those measurements ready, I thought, oh, well, this might be a handy tool. So though I can't post the pattern because it is a copyrighted pattern, so I can't post it and just make it free because it's not mine to do that. I can post these if you're interested. So I did one for a female doll and a male doll. And these both have like where you can take measurements of your doll and then you can write down what those measurements are. And I'm going to format these on eight and a half by 11 paper, which is standard letter size for the US. And then there will be things on the side if for adding a little bit more detail. And then these can be printed out at eight and a half by 11, sorry, size paper. And then I'll probably make one a little bit smaller that can fit into the ball jointed doll registry books that I also have posted on the website so that you could put it in there for your records and have it handy. So that way you don't have to remeasure your doll all the time. You'll have a spot where all her measurements are or where all his measurements are. So these I will make available if you think that would be handy, then you can get a copy. Nevertheless, 
I did measure, and the, the most significant measurement that was going to differ would be in the waistline um, and the length of the arms. So, and then the length of the legs. Um, she's taller than this skirt actually ended up being. So, now, oh, goodness. Okay, roll up our sleeves here. So then, once I had these ready, I grabbed my tissue paper. And on the bodice, I found that it was just not quite wide enough for her waist. So there's a couple things that you could do. And let's see, this is the front. And I need the back. And the one is these have a pretty large dart in the side. And I didn't want to change the dart and make the dart more shallow because she does have a good figure and I wanted the darts to fit properly. So what I did is I took this that was long enough and I just extended out on the side just about a little over an eighth, um, an eighth of an inch or a half a centimeter on the side so that it would give that little bit of extra width to go around her torso. And so I did it here. Then I went ahead and this is the center front cut on a fold. So I actually just made it one piece. And on both sides, I extended out that side piece by about a half a centimeter on both sides. So I did that. And then on these pieces of the bodice as well. And then her arms are quite a bit longer than this pattern. So I knew that this piece that is the puff for the elbow needs to be able to fit into the pattern. So I did not change that part of the pattern. I left it the same. So there we go. So the top part here where it needs to fit the other piece is the same. But I did add a little bit of width and then length according to my doll's arm length so that the length of the sleeve would be long enough for her. So that's the changes I made onto the bodice and the sleeve. The petticoat, uh, like I say, the, the yoke, I think will be fine. And then the other sleeve pieces, because they're all gathered, they're going to be fine. And I didn't really change the top of the garment at all. Then I had to add length for the petticoat pieces because my doll is taller. And so I added the pieces or added the length on the pieces. And when I got them all done, I had a thought. And it seemed kind of odd to me that all these underskirt and petticoat pieces were all long strips and I don't I don't know the reasoning for that because it would be a lot of up and down seams that to me just seemed unnecessary um, I guess if you're working with remnants of fabric and so you want long strips so that you can put your pieces in and make better use of scraps then that would be all right but I also went ahead and I laid these out overlapping enough to account for the seam allowance and cut a piece uh, on the fold for the front that would be the underskirt in just one piece. Um, so, yeah, so it's it does need a bigger piece of fabric, but I don't know, maybe it's because they want the grain to follow, and that could be it. If you want the grain to follow um, the length of the piece all the way around, then that would make sense, I suppose. But so I went ahead and did that anyway, just so I could have it in one piece, because the overskirt, which also had to be lengthened for the hue or wrong, it ends up being one giant piece intentionally, and this is the one on the top that will show. And so there, there it is. 
in all its glory. <laughs> so there's the long overskirt piece. So it has been enlarged and the extra length added to fit to a wrong. Okay, so there's all of my pieces ready to go. I'm not sure yet if I will use uh, these pieces for the underskirt or the solid piece. Um, I'll maybe let my actual fabric kind of dictate that. But I guess if you just want the grain of the fabric to continually go down the center of the piece, that would make sense. Um, you're just going to have a lot of seams. Um, so you need to be prepared for something like that. If you have a skirt or petticoat with that many pieces, um, it just seems like a lot of seams. So, whew, was that a mess? <laughs> so now that I have everything uh, enlarged and fitted with measurements against the actual doll, I think we're ready to go ahead and pick out some fabrics. After looking through some of the fabrics that I have available, um, because since it's a first attempt, I don't want to shop. I want to just use up some things I have. I've decided to go with the following. It'll be more of a modern take, but I like the colors, so I'm going to go with it. So here we go. On the petticoat, I found this that um, evidently was cut off of the edge of something. So <laughs> I've had it in a box for ages, but it's a wonderful eyelet border. So I'm going to cut a little bit above the edge and then this I will go ahead and gather some of this to use this for the ruffle on the petticoat. So here's my uh, petticoat edging. So I thought that would be fun. Then on the dress, well the petticoat, yeah, and then I have some just white fabric um, that I think is reclaimed from something that will be the actual petticoat skirt that I'll sew this to. So that's the petticoat. Then for the dress, I picked this kind of a dark sage green satin. Um, I don't know. It's just what I had. I'm hoping it's long and or wide enough for the skirt piece because it's a fairly large piece of fabric. And then I can always use the selvages for the bodice pieces and the sleeves. So that's the that part. So the main dress will be green. And then I have this. That's the questionable part, but I think I'm going to go ahead and go with it. It's just an odd colored lace with some green well, green and gray and like salmon-y pink colors. Um, and I'm going to use this for the overdress and the over bodice pieces. Um, just, I just thought it would look nice over the green. So let's see if this will show up here. Turn it so it's not a glare. So it will look like this. So it'll have a green underlay, but then the the overskirt will be this colory lacy thing. I'm hoping it doesn't look too camo, but we'll try it. And like I say, I've got a big enough piece that I think this will work. Then for trims, I found this wide lace that I think will look nice as the uh, lace, let's see, for the sleeves here. And it may end up that the, the colored lace is only on the skirt. And then I may use this for the pieces of the, the overlay on the bodice and the sleeves. Um, it's not quite as pointed as I would like, but it is scalloped on the edge. So I can use this for the puffy part on the sleeves and then the lacy bodice part. And then the trim on the overskirt 
and possibly the underskirt and the wrists will be this. Uh, it's kind of like it has a oh I don't like a vellum look to it and um, but anyway it kind of matches this piece and they're a little bit of an off-white so I'm hoping that'll kind of age it a little bit and um, yeah so the next piece to do oh and I have some pink just in case I want pink for something I don't know that I will but I might put it on the petticoat underneath where the ruffle connects to the petticoat I may use this um, or I might use some of this on the little one-piece undergarment um, and I have so, a lot of like creams and whites little edgings that I can use for that and that would just probably be a white or off-white muslin so that's my fabrics so the next job will be to get everything cut out now that all our fabrics are cut I'm going to start with the little undergarment piece it's called combination I think it's because it's combination of top and bottom all one piece and then uh, the petticoat skirt is what I'm going to do first and it looks like according to the diagrams that the front will have the darts and a front opening lots of lace trim around the neckline arms and legs but then on the bum we're going to have a little puffed bum piece that's going to go on that will actually have an opening like you know old-fashioned uh, long underwear had the little back opening so it'll have a front opening with buttons but it'll also have the little bum opening in the back so I read through our directions my first step will be to sew in the darts which I have marked onto the fabric and to do the front crotch seam which is this seam here and the way this is built is much the same as when I do the fly on a pair of uh, gentlemen's trousers and so that uh, looks very familiar to me so that won't be a problem so it'll be the crotch seam then this will uh, one side will fold this way and then the other side and then there will be an overlap um, so that you can actually have a front closure there and then on the back this is where it gets a little more tricky because there's a lot of pieces so after reading my instructions let's grab our our pieces here <laughs> it's going to be a little complicated oh here turn this guy this way okay so the first thing to do is we're going to let's see stitch the center back here together then this will end up being the the inseam and then this part will be folded here on both sides because that's going to be part of the opening then remember these are going to be sewn together then here is going to be gathered to match this length that will create a band on the top then the side seam will be sewn or the side back will be sewn to the back here and here and then this will be sewn so that it overlaps the back what I'm going to do also is to serge the bottom of this back piece because it's going to be laying free underneath and so when I put this on top with the, the little gathers and the band I want this edge to be finished because it's going to be kind of like free floating but I'm going to sew this piece to the side backs first so that once they're sewn together this piece ends up being on top of that one so it's going to be fun we're going to go ahead and give it a shot and see how it turns out this is an interesting pattern I've never sewn anything quite like this one but I'm excited to try it 
Okay, so I'm just beginning into this process, but so far I am <laughs> I am so tickled because this is going to be one of the cutest things ever. So I gathered that little piece and I did stitch down the folds just because I want that to um, the flap not to keep coming forward. So I stitched that down. The one change I did make instead of the little band, I did get an actual piece of bias tape and stitched the gathered piece to the bias tape so that I would have room to go up and over and then fold it down and have a nice band because the other one was so tiny that I know I would just end up getting frustrated. Now to close off the ends of this band you can turn it on you know inside and then just fold it and then tack it on the ends but when I do this, I kind of like to do it the same way I do on a shirt cuff. So here it's already a bias tape with the folds towards the inside. So I'm going to turn it back good side to good side. And I'm just going to stitch on the ends right here and over on this end. And what that'll do is it'll create a seam for me to flip it and then those ends will already be uh, tucked in and sewn and then all I have to do is tack it to the inside by hand. Um, so I am going to do that. That's just kind of how I like to finish the ends of a little band because then once I get that sewn I can trim away some of this seam allowance rather than trying to fit it all in by hand and to hand stitch it. And I'll probably go just a little bit higher there and uh, stitch that and then I can stitch it on the inside and know that none of my stitches will come through to the outside but this is what the little bum is gonna look like it's gonna be so cute <laughs> so I just thought I would check in with this much that's done so now we can kind of see how this is going to lay over the back piece it'll look well I'll turn this in there we go so it'll lay over the back piece like this and then our side backs will be, you know, here. So it's going to be really cute. And then these little pieces, yeah, I'm not going to use. I just went ahead and used bias tape. Um, because you can see, either I'd have to serge the edges of this tiny piece, or try to fold them in and only have this tiny, tiny little band. And my fingers just will not do that. I don't want to mess with it. So this works better for me. So that's where I am so far, but I thought I'd check in because just getting this much done, I'm already in love with this piece. So I think it's going to be really cute when we're done. Here we have just a little note. I'm ready to, I've done all the stay stitching on all these pieces on the edges, um, which just kind of helps your fabric go together a little bit better. And now I'm going to go ahead and put the little back of the bum to the side back. And I wanted it to be layered first. And so I just thought I would show a real quick thing here. When I go, I'm going to start at the bottom and then go up just so that it ends up getting placed correctly. And if you'll notice, once I put these two ends together, you can see how the curve goes in the opposite direction. So when I go to sew it in the machine, and I'm going to flip it up this way because I like my uh, edge to be on the inside. So when I line this up, you can see how those curves go the opposite direction. I'm not going to pin that. This is just my preference. Um, a lot of people would like to go ahead and pin it. But what I like to do, and these are tiny seams, guys. They're just a little over an eighth of an inch. Um, I'm going to anchor this with a little bit of back tack. Just a couple to kind of anchor it. And I'm holding onto my threads to kind of help pull it through to get it started. Now what I like to do is I like to actually bring those edges together as it goes through so that my, as far as my machine is concerned, I'm sewing a straight line. I'm not going to try to pin it and then sew around a curve. So I just thought I would do this in uh, the camera view here. So I'm just pulling that edge together. And I'm going to sew a little bit. I'm going to 
check my edge a little bit. So a little bit more. I'm going to bring it and I'm just kind of placing that and bringing it together as I'm getting ready to feed it into the machine. Just a little bit of a time and I'm only going to sew to where that fold is and then I'm going to back tack there. So I'm kind of watching to make sure I only go up to where that little dot was located. There we go and I'm going to back tack to anchor that and pull it out. And then here's my seam. Um, I just prefer not to try to pin because a lot of times in my experience I end up giving myself pleats. Um, but then we have our seam. So there we go. And now what I can do, since this is already on, now I can do this piece on here and it'll be kind of the same thing. I'm not going to pin this one either. And so I'm going to start at the underarm and up here at the bust. So we're going to line this up. And again, I'll just anchor it with a couple stitches. And just back tack just a couple. There we go. Now I'm going to bring that edge together as I go around and it's very curvy so I'm only going to go a little bit at a time and then sometimes I'm going to go ahead and lift my foot a little bit just to kind of bring that edge together. Then I'll come a little bit more. But see, trying to pin this, in my experience, just doesn't really work very well. Okay, a couple more. Right now I'm right about at the tip of the curvature, but it's the back, actually. Okay, and now it's kind of starting to match a little bit better but this from my perspective <laughs> like I say a lot of people might have different uh, preferences but I just kind of like this better so then I'm going to bring this and lay it up and then bring this down and it looks like I have a little bit of a gap so that up here. It's almost perfect but there is just a tiny bit of a gap but I think my seam allowance will account for that pretty well. Okay. So I'm going to come down just a tiny 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 bit of a gap. And then once I get down to this lower seam I'm going to go ahead and back tack and pull it out. So now I have that all put together and then this can be on top like so. So there we go and then I've got a couple of threads I'll kind of pull out. But there is the back piece um, one side of it and so now I'll have to do the other side. So there we go. And it's not too much of a gap here. It kind of pretty much exactly fits. So that's fine. And then this will attach probably with a snap here on either side once I get the other side put on there. So there we go. So that's how I put that together. But I thought since I'm doing it, I might as well put it on camera just to show how I do these curvy lines when when you line it up into the machine. It, it, it doesn't lay evenly on the fabric. You've got fabrics here, but if you bring those together as you're going into your needle, uh, sometimes it just makes it a lot easier. Now I am going to serge this edge because this will be showing on the inside of the garment and I don't want any raw edges showing and that will also help anchor those two little edges. So there we go. So I'll finish up the back here 
and then I'll go ahead and do the front pieces, put the, the darts in, and then I think I just do the shoulders and sew it together and do my fancy little hem with lace and uh, yeah, should go together pretty simply and then we'll be back. So now I'm at the point that I just need to uh, finish the the legs. What I did is I surged uh, the edge. The instructions say to do the inseam first and then do the side seams, but I like to do the entire hem of the legs. So I did the side seams first and then I surged the edge and then I'm going to go ahead and put a little bit of lace on it to add that decorative touch and then once I get the lace on both of the legs then I'll go ahead and do the inseam. The inseam part is done when the little bustle bum here <laughs> uh, I'll gather the bottom edge so that the inseam matches because uh, it's just a little bit bigger right now and so it just has a little bit of gather to fit uh, that inseam line um, from the front and uh, then uh, it'll be done except for the, the closure. So here's what we have thus far and I'm hoping I didn't make it too skinny. So there we go. So got this and then uh, there we go. On the pictures it looks like this is like gathered to fit the leg, but I think I'm just going to let it just um, hang loose. So, yeah, so there we go. We're almost done. And here is the finished little undergarment. And I used some reclaimed fabric, so some of it is a little dark on the beige, but it makes it look more kind of antique ish, I guess. And then let's see here, we'll move her hair. Here is the back with the little bum flap here, which turned out really cute. So here's the little the little flap right here, and it has snaps here. And then I put lace on here. I didn't gather the bottom. I just thought I'm just going to let it uh, hang down. And then uh, the back. I did go ahead and I made, I took the side seams and... Um, I'd gone in a little deep, so once I had it surged, I went ahead and took the seam out a little bit because she is a fuller figure and it was a very snug fit, but it does snap up um, with the snaps and it does fit and it does close. And then on the darts, I went ahead and made them a little more narrow as well just to give a little bit more room because she does have more more in here. But it does fit her, so I'm glad with our adjustments and uh, enlargements and a little bit of tweaking, it does fit her, and I'm very pleased with the result. So because this took a little bit longer, um, I'm going to go ahead and end the video here, and then we'll go ahead and do the petticoat skirt in a different video, and then just continue on this outfit to get it done. But at least now she's got her undergarment ready so that she's clothed while we do the rest of the sewing. So I'll see you next time and take care. Bye.